Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for, um, for joining uh, us today in this webinar on uh, developing just-in-time adaptive interventions to counter stress uh, with a focus on both promises and pitfalls. Um, this is the, um, the third webinar uh, in an ongoing series of the FPA project group on eHealth. Um, and let me quickly give you a, a short introduction to both the, uh, the webinar as well as the context. So we are uh, um, the members of the eHealth Workstream, part of the Standing Committee on Psychology and Health. Uh, and you can find a lot of information at the moment uh, through ehealth.fpa.eu, um, like previous recordings of past webinars, um, some uh, policy documents, uh, also some recent publications and guidelines that we've developed uh, over the years. Um, some contact information as well. So um, definitely worthwhile to, uh, to check out if you're interested in, uh, in this domain. Um, and also uh, your war warm welcome uh, to all of you on October 17th and October 26th, which will be the fourth and fifth webinar in this, uh, in this ongoing series. Uh, one on machine learning by David Gozar and one on global online classrooms by Niels Peter Gihard. Um, so, that's enough of, of background, uh, maybe to just jump right ahead and jump forward with the, the program for today. Um, so with us today, we have Professor Andreas Schwertfeger from the University of Graz. He is a professor and head, head of the health psychology unit with a focus on cardiovascular psychophysiology, stress and emotion, psychosocial resources and resilience, and psychophysiological ecological momentary assessment. It's quite the mouthful. Um, aside from that, he's also the associate editor of Anxiety, Stress uh, and Coping and the European Journal of Health Psychology. Uh, so in his uh, capacity as the representative of the Professional Association of Austrian Psychologists, um, he will be sharing with us some of his uh, expertise today. So uh, Andreas, uh, you can go ahead and share your screen now. The uh, floor is yours. All right, so I, I'm going to talk about some, yeah, just recent developments that are going on in, in our department uh, in, in, at the University of Graz in health psychology. It's about the development of just-in-time adaptive interventions. So this is the, the big picture that is somehow behind our, our research uh, efforts. Um, and after all, we, we started with, with uh, quite some enthusiasm and ended uh, with slight disappointments or um, let's say some, some kind of, uh, yeah, more, more research need to be done. Uh, so this just-in-time adaptive interventions are of course uh, on the agenda for several years now, but still when you look in the literature, into the trials that really apply this uh, just-in-time adaptive interventions, you see that there's quite a lot of conceptualization, some empirical reports, but many discussions uh, about this, uh, yeah, its possibility uh, or its, its promises and, and its pitfalls. So um, I, I want to start with some, yeah, uh, food for thought. So what if questions? And uh, I think this is really important to, to reconsider if, if we really would like to use the JIDIs at all or whether they, they also have some or could make some, some troubles and problems. So what if technical aids and algorithms could detect how we are feeling? And, you know, I am a psychologist, so I'm really much interested in, in feeling states on a momentary level. So how does our feeling fluctuate across different situations, contexts, and, and so on? Uh, or even um, detect uh, how our body uh, um, uh, works right now in a given moment in time. What if we were informed about uh, when we are particularly productive or creative or also vulnerable? So my postdoc, Christian Rominger, whom I will introduce uh, at the end uh, and, and give a big thank, uh, thanks uh, to him, um, he's particularly interested in creative processes. And he was just wondering whether we could predict in everyday life, in every moment, would this be a great moment to do some creative tasks or not? Or are there moments when, when we are vulnerable for, for self-injury or, or depression and, and so on? 
What if we received help in our daily lives exactly when we needed it the most? Sounds quite thrilling and, and interesting, but of course it somehow also uh, challenges your privacy, right? Do we want that others, perhaps professionals, uh, can exactly track when we feel vulnerable or not? It might be perfect when we are really in need of help, but otherwise it could be slightly disturbing probably. So the question is, are JIDIs the solution? And I think research now sees uh, much of the benefits and the possibilities in, in JIDIs, but still they, they, they are quite hesitant in discussing the, the downfalls of, of this uh, just-in-time adaptive intervention. So of course, there are several pitfalls. Uh, why are these uh, JIDIs uh, potentially interesting? Of course, you, you might know that there are a lot of smartphones around in the world, right? And these are just uh, numbers from 2014 uh, with a global population of about 7 billion people and already over 5 billion mobile phones uh, in the world. And the number is, is steadily increasing. So um, except myself, you know, I... Honestly, I do not have a smartphone. <laughs> I just have a very old Nokia mobile phone. Uh, but nearly everybody has a smartphone uh, today. And 90% uh, of the users actually carry them with them 24 hours a day. So this is great potential, right, for uh, healthcare. And from my personal perspective, you know, I'm a health psychologist. There's great potential for health psychology as well, right, to somehow motivate people, for example, in, in the right moment to do some exercising or to uh, think of their uh, uh, food consumption, to stop smoking and, and so on, just in the moment when they are most vulnerable. Uh, so uh, the potential is, is definitely there. So what are JIDIs actually? Um, JIDIs are customized interventions uh, that are not only tailored to differences between individuals. Of course, you could somehow tailor these JIDIs for every person individually somehow, uh, but uh, it is a strong within-person perspe uh, perspective. So it aims really to track an individual in their daily life and to identify you know, a moment when everything works fine at moments when, when they are somehow vulnerable or at risk, you know, for a certain behavior, for, for certain uh, cognitions or, or emotions. And when you look at uh, interventions, uh, particularly in the health psychology field, um, you see quite a tradition of uh, tailoring interventions to the inter-individual level so that every person gets a specialized treatment, right? It, it all comes down, you know, to, to algorithms, very simple algorithms derived from uh, theories in health psychology. For example, uh, the uh, trans-theoretical model, Prokaska de Clemente, you know, the spiral model where you have these stages of change and uh, you could identify if an individual is, is in a um, very early stage of thinking of, of a health problem or already try to, to implement some kind of new behavior. But when we uh, look at the uh, literature, actually meta-analysis, we see quite modest effects only of such inter-individual tailoring of interventions. Right? You see the effect sizes down there from 0.07 is not not even point 0.1, right? Point 0.12 maybe when you tailor it exactly to, to a certain individual. But initially we had much more promise into these um, uh, tailored interventions and they turned out to be not that overly, overly good. So the next step could then be to not look just between individual, individuals, but within individuals, right? The within perspective. So uh, these are actually interventions that try to track time sensitive uh, when an individual is in, in need uh, for something. Um, the content of the timing is uh, based on dynamically collected data. And this is of course now much more possible than in the past. So we have uh, really 
very, very sophisticated computers in our smartphones, actually, uh, that can collect a huge amount of data simultaneously and also process this data. And so the opportunity is to really uh, trying to identify certain patterns out of a multitude of data and then to deliver such interventions is steadily increasing. Now, important is that the intervention is really controlled by the system and not by the individual themselves. So this is something completely new. Uh, in the past, we were particularly interested in so-called pull interventions, right? We try to pull the individual uh, to do some, some exercises or some um, other forms of uh, emotion regulation and, and so on. But these interventions really try to push the individuals when it's the right moment in time. And uh, in principle, um, the individual or client or patient should be involved in this kind of intervention development, which rarely happens, actually. You know, it's still a matter of academics thinking about, oh, this would benefit a patient particularly well. But uh, especially when you try to get into the everyday life of every person, it is quite important to ask the person whether this would be okay when there are certain moments where they want not to get disturbed by the system and so on. So this is very important to, to have these uh, clients or patients uh, within this development. Now, the key concept of these JEDIs uh, three, are three, threefold. The first concept, and I will particularly focus on this first concept of vulnerability. So we are particularly interested in our research to detect moments of vulnerability. So when does a person actually need an intervention? Right? And this is, uh, I think, the, the main task. But there are, of course, other important things to consider. For example, the opportunity. When does the intervention really fit into the daily routine of a person? There might be moments when the, this intervention is not really appropriate. Although the person might be in need, but it is in a very different context and we can't really disturb the person in this context. So are there certain opportunities? And then, of course, a receptivity. So when is a person particularly receptive to it? When is the person willing somehow right, to, to engage in short, brief interventions or exercises? So all three aspects are really key concepts in the JEDI developments. And I will mainly focus on the vulnerability thing. Um, Tom already mentioned that one of my research, key research interests is cardiovascular psychophysiology and ecological momentary assessment. And as a psychophysiologist, uh, I'm particularly interested in heart rate variability. Well, heart rate variability is a simple and complex thing. Uh, it, just means that you track the individual heartbeats of an individual. The heart beats not really in a steady manner like a metronome, but it has certain delays between heartbeats, right? And these delays are particularly interesting for us as psychologists, but also for physicians, for example, because the more modulation you have between the individual heartbeats, as long as these are healthy heartbeats, right? not arrhythmias or ectopic beats, but really healthy heartbeats, the stronger is your autonomic flexibility and your parasympathetic nerve acting on the heart, which is the vagus nerve, so the vagal brake that acts here somehow. And uh, this way, heart rate variability has been uh, discussed as a uh, particularly relevant for psychology because it's associated with kind of emotion regulation, with adaptability to different environmental demands. And in general, it also predicts longevity or mortality inversely. So heart rate variability could be particularly interesting to monitor during everyday life and then to detect episodes when there is something going on, you know, when the autonomic flexibility somehow shrinks or, or uh, get, get reduced. Um, there are several uh, papers out there, several research 
articles uh, looking into the role of, of heart rate variability, uh, especially for health, right, and longevity and vulnerability and so on. So this is quite well known. We know that heart rate variability is a key variable that could be of interest then for, for GDIs. However, when you look more closely into the psychological literature, you see a vast amount of different psychological concepts being associated with heart rate variability. You see, it's a general indicator of health that is associated with anxiety, stress, with physical fitness, well-being, depression, and so on and so on. And this makes it quite challenging because HRV is a kind of umbrella term for everything that is, is good when you look at the higher heart rate variability or bad, which is lower heart rate variability. And so this is one of the challenges, I think, also in using HRV for this uh, just-in-time adaptive interventions, because you, you, you might not want to trigger, uh, for example, a certain state of, of well-being or a positive activated effect, but you might want to trigger some, some stress, for example, or ruminative thoughts depressive symptoms and, and so on. And this is not that easy, actually, as it turned out. So I'm going to introduce now, first of all, a, a simple way where we try to you know, find correspondences between heart rate variability and psychological concepts in everyday life. So we are going out of the laboratory into everyday life. We use uh, ecological momentary assessment with smartphones and mobile sensors for, for um, uh, analyzing heart rate variability, but also bodily movement, because this is strongly tied uh, to each other. And usually we uh, just set random uh, assessments. About every 45 minutes, we ask individuals with a certain random component in between, we ask them how they actually feel across several days, right? So we have usually 10 assessments per day, sometimes 12 assessments, and then we uh, do this study for three days, uh, sometimes five days, so we get 60, 70 assessments per individual, and then can really see whether the differences within individuals in their feeling states are somehow associated with uh, increases or decreases in heart rate variability. This is an interesting approach, um, but uh, of course, given the random assessment, uh, just random time points, we might miss certain moments in time right, that might be particularly interesting. So just to give some examples, what, what we found and where, where we actually come from then into the development of the GDIs now. Uh, we found uh, interesting associations with social interactions, for example, particularly in individuals who are vulnerable for depression, probably, because they show elevated depressive symptoms. And when we actually um, uh, monitor these individuals in, in everyday life, mon monitor their heart rate variability, we can see particularly individuals with high depression scores that they show lower heart rate variability when they are alone, but this somehow gets better. It increases when they are engaged in social interactions and particularly with friends uh, and with partners or family members, so with close others somehow. This points towards a possible GDI that could be done, right, particularly in individuals who are vulnerable to to depression, uh, that such social warm connections somehow, interactions could help them stabilize their autonomic flexibility and also their well-being when we detect these moments. Um, we found no such interactions with not so close uh, uh, interaction partners like strangers or, or colleagues. Um, so this is uh, something that is particularly interesting. We could look, you know, at the social aspects and, and trying to use social interactions. That's a very unobtrusive intervention, right, for individuals vulnerable to these um, 
um, kind of, of depressive symptoms, for example. Uh, we replicated the findings with shiners. I don't want to go into, into much detail here. So again, uh, usually shy individuals uh, show lower heart rate variability, especially when they are alone. But this somehow gets better and it increases when they are in safe and uh, close connections, right? Where they might get some, some boost for their self-esteem or something like that. And we also, also uh, found in these uh, studies that uh, these uh, effects are particularly pronounced uh, in real life social interactions and not so much in, in interactions that are computer mediated. And this is something that we learned quite recently, right? That uh, uh, many, many young individuals particularly, they have many, many social interactions via computer, social media, and, and so on. And we could not yet observe that these beneficial effects are really also available in, in such uh, uh, computer-mediated interaction. There are certain theories about it, cues filtered out hypothesis, for example, that you do not get so many channels of information, like in real life, you know, the, the smell and, and sometimes even the physical contact and so on, which might all be important to feel somehow self and comfort, uh, uh, safe and comfortable in such situations. Um, then we uh, uh, did some recent studies where we went away a slightly bit from, from the social interactions and looked more into uh, the feelings of, of safety, actually. So we just asked individuals several times a day, how safe do you feel? And we instructed them what we meant by safety, right? So it's not only a kind of, of physical safety, so when you're walking around at night in the park, for example, you might not feel that safe. Or when you walk uh, uh, near near uh, a road and with with uh, high traffic uh, around, uh, but also kind of of psychological safety, right? Feeling comfortable and safe in in a certain moment. And this could, of course, be. Uh, associated with uh, social interactions with close others, but also with many other situations. And so uh, we actually um, found that higher safety ratings were also associated with higher heart rate variability and lower heart rate in general, and lower safety, so moments when they felt really less safe, were accompanied by lower heart rate variability and higher heart rate. So this is, uh, if, if you like, another measure of maybe a bit more sensitive measure than generally asking for how stressful do you feel right now or how stressed do you feel so it's more a feeling of, of safety which we know from from the clinical uh, psychology trauma and ptsd and and so on which is somehow important to have moments in daily life when we feel safe and secured somehow um, so when, when safety is missing, there are some interesting theories, and I really can recommend uh, the um, uh, articles by Jos Proshu from University of Leiden in, in the Netherlands, who uh, developed the generalized unsafety theory of stress, and he um, proposes that uh, stress is, is a default state that is automatically there when we are in, in an unsafe situation right in an unsafe context otherwise safety somehow inhibits the stress responses that are automatically initialized when safety is gone um, so this is our our new target somehow in our research looking somehow at safety and now let's turn to the jedis again so uh the main question that that we uh then had in mind was okay, let's not ask at, at uh, really random moments in time how individuals are feeling, but just use heart rate variability whenever, for example, it is decreasing from a higher level or is lower as a certain predicted level. And then compare these assessments with assessments that are randomly spaced, right? So when HRE is not really lower, 
to get a feeling if we can use now HRV to predict certain uh, feeling states. This idea is not really that new. It has been proposed by Brown and Bart Berkeu in the Netherlands as well, but it's also uh, grounded on, on quite uh, old uh, empirical uh, reports uh, put forward by Michael Mürtek from the University of Freiburg in Germany, who already in the 1990s conducted studies with this additional heart rate in everyday life. So what is the idea behind it? In, I told uh, you uh, a couple of minutes ago that heart rate variability is closely connected to bodily movement, right? So when you start moving, moving around, your heart rate variability will decrease. And he says, absolutely nothing to do with your feeling state. It's just a metabolic adjustment of the heart, right? To, uh, provide um, uh, nutrients and, and oxygen to, to the muscles. So we need to account for, for uh, bodily movement. And Michael Mürtek suggested that we, that we really partial out bodily movement in every moment in time. And then just looking at the additional increase in heart rate, this might inform us about the psychological feeling states of an individual. And the same has then been proposed by Bart Berkeu and Stephen Brown uh, with the heart rate variability. So we need to partial out bodily movement and what is left over must have to do something with psychology, with psychological feelings. So we use this approach and then try to predict uh, what are you doing right now? How do you feel right now? And, and so on. Now, if these physiological triggers in principle work, right, when we can exactly predict that an individual, when HRV is lower or decreasing, can predict uh, that this individual is really feeling bad, stressed, less safe, and so on, then it would be good, right, to get into the situation and then give a brief intervention, for example, slow breathing, and we did quite a lot of of uh, studies on the slow paced breathing with uh, six hertz. That means around every 10 seconds breathing in, breathing out, which really helps to stabilize autonomic nervous system function and also benefits psychological things like well-being and so on. So this is the main idea behind it. But now the question is, how do we arrive at these physiological triggers? And I want to give you a brief uh, introduction to this. Uh, it, it depends on which devices you use. It's not that easy. Actually, we use these movie sense devices that allow a communication between the physiological device that measures the ECG and heart rate variability, but also uh, bodily movement, and the smartphone, right, which then assess your uh, psychological feeling states. So there's a Bluetooth connection, and both devices con can communicate with each other. So that whenever a physiological event happens, it can be directly transferred to the smartphone, asking people how they actually feel. This sounds at first quite interesting and easy to do because, you know, we live in a world where everything is uh, full of, of techniques and everything works in principle fine. But when you go into the exact studies then into detail, uh, you realize that you know, the Bluetooth connection is not always reliable. Some smartphones just shut off in the middle of the study. Uh, sometimes the devices do not deliver the, the uh, information that you want. Uh, it strongly depends on the Android version of your smartphone and so on. So it's really full of technical problems up till now. But this is just uh, from my own experience now with extensive studies like this. Uh, now we know that HRV fluctuates within individuals and depending uh, on, on various physiological contextual information. So we have uh, bodily movement as the core variable that we need to control for, but this is just a kind of outlook. What we do not do yet, but should probably also do is to control for respiration, speaking patterns, food consumption, momentary smoking, and so on if persons are smokers, because all these variables somehow really have quite an impact on heart rate variability. And 
ideally you should also control for all these variables in real time, right? And then figure out, okay, and what is now left over? This is really something that it must have to do with your feeling state. Okay, at present we are not able really to control for all these variables, but we use bodily movement, right? And this is a very uh, prominent confound. Um, then we need to realize that the dynamics of HRV really strongly differs between individuals. So there, there, are, uh, there, there is not a unified association, for example, between heart rate variability and bodily movement, right? So every individual has a different relationship. Right? We figured out that we really need to uh, calibrate such algorithms that later will uh, identify moments of lower heart rate variability. Um, so, so we need to, to have a good, solid calibration procedure for every individual so that the algorithm is really individualized, right? Otherwise, it, it will uh, simply not, not work. Uh, the general idea is just a very, very simple regression approach. Of course, there are many other ideas of, of inverse regressions and, and so on, or corvilinear regressions. There are many different uh, uh, possibilities how to do this, but in general, uh, we calculate a regression uh, between heart rate variability and bodily movement for every person, right? And we do this usually across one day, 12 hours. And our naive idea is that when we have this information across one day of an individual, we then can really identify such moments of additional heart rate variability reductions, that means non-metabolic, in the subsequent days. This is a simple assumption, and we are now in the process of, of really analyzing whether this one-day calibration is really enough, or do we need more to get more robust estimates. Then the next thing to consider is that a single episode of reduced heart rate variability, this additional heart rate variability reduction, might not be psychosocially relevant or robust. So usually we analyze the data in one minute segments, right? And when we see at this one minute HRV is lower than we would predict by the certain amount of movement given in this moment, right? then there could be something interesting going on. This could be too short somehow, right? Because heart rate variability decreases really frequently depending on very, very different uh, circumstances. So we need to figure out how many of these segments, these reductions are really needed. So the number of the segments in a specific time frame needs to be specified. Let's say, for example, we have a time frame of 10 minutes or 20 minutes, where we really analyze with every minute the reduction in heart rate variability. So we could potentially look into the data and see, okay, which pattern of decreases will predict how the person feels thereafter, right? Are these seven of these reductions, seven minutes of lower heart rate variability in a time window of 10 minutes? or seven decreases in a time window of 20 minutes and so on. So there are many, many, many different opportunities to, to do this kind of, of, of uh, uh, simulation somehow. And uh, so we, we really try to uh, look into the data first to see whether there are patterns that could be predictive of a certain feeling state, right? And then, of course, there are many other settings that need to be controlled. So think of a person who walks around in daily life and gets a trigger because heart rate variability went down right, for a certain period of time. And then the person gets the trigger doing some exercises and so on. So you probably do not want that this person gets the next alarm 10 minutes later or five minutes later because heart rate variability still is down. Um, so you need to somehow specify a kind of silence mode, right? So there is a trigger, then we need a certain amount of time where the individual is just left alone, 20 minutes, 60 minutes, 
we do not know which time is perfect for this, right? But we want to prevent the individual from getting excessive alarms over and over again. Okay, uh, so there are many unknown parameters actually. And uh, what we did were we doing some simulations. Uh, so we had a data set where we asked uh, for social interactions and we asked for the quality of social interactions because this is something that where we came from, right? We, you remember the studies that I presented from social interactions and there are of course social interactions also that are, have a low quality right, where there's not everything is fine and warm, but more cold, distanced, and, and so on. So we asked about the, the uh, perceived quality of these interactions. We could assess it quite reliable. I don't want to go into, into much details here on the assessment of this one. We also applied our movie sense devices again. Then we uh, let uh, uh, individuals uh, we left them alone for 12 hours to get a calibration uh, for every person so that we have uh, a regression model that then can predict the next days, uh, ideally, the quality of social interactions happening to them. Right? And this is just a formalization of the trigger. It will get a bit uh, 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 more clear, I think, in the next slide where you can see person across five hours, I think, uh, where you can see the light blue line, heart rate variability, when you see it really fluctuates around, right? It went up, it went down, and so on. And the red line at the bottom is uh, the bodily movement, right? And you remember that we had a regression approach, so now we are partialing out bodily movement, and what is left over, and heart rate variability goes down, although we control for bodily movement, this might be an interesting episode. And this is exactly the predicted line, is this uh, strong blue line of heart rate variability controlled for bodily movement. And you can see, okay, sometimes it went down even more uh, than, than bodily movement. And then you can see in every minute here, in every segment, you get a potential trigger Right? You could say, okay, this could be interesting, this could be interesting. And here you can see that this is just one person, right? We can get an excessive amount. You see it in the black asterisks here at the, bot, uh, at the top line. It's a, an excessive amount of such uh, um, decreases in heart rate variability. And you do not want, probably, right, to trigger the person in every minute, right? But you need to aggregate it across longer time spans. This is something that we then did with this green asterisk at the very top here, where we try to have a certain amount of, of decreases and then say, okay, that's enough now. Let's trigger the person, for example. Uh, so in, in these studies, we really try to find different patterns of heart rate variability, decreases in different time frames to predict lower quality social interactions at the next prompt, right? And we did a lot of, of uh, calculations. We did um, uh, actually uh, trying to compare then these triggers that would have been emitted, right? This is all a data set that had already been recorded. So we're just looking which pattern of heart rate variability decreases would have predicted in this data set the next uh, um, uh, assessment of social uh, quality of social interactions. Um, and so we, we did a lot of simulation and what we actually arrive are, are these hyperplanes. When you scan the codes there, you can then uh, rotate these graphs and look more in detail into these graphs. But what, what we see in principle is that there are a lot of different combinations of heart rate variability decreases uh, associated with lower quality of social interactions. These are the beta weights, you know, the, the regression coefficients predicting uh, the quality of social interactions. And these are the power simulations that we've done. So with each combination, let's say seven minutes of decreases in the time window of 15 minutes, we calculate the power whether this um, uh, effect on social interactions has a strong power that is, is homogeneous within 
individuals. And we, so we came across a trigger setting of 13 decreases in the time frame of 29 minutes prior to a social interaction that predicts lower quality right, with a power of 0.80, which we considered, okay, this is quite, quite nice. This is the yellow top here in this graph. So this is an approach right, it's where we try to somehow uh, use such data that we already got to uh, see whether there are combinations heart rate variability decreases beyond predicted by bodily movement that predict a certain psychological feeling state. So this is a first step, right, to, to arrive at uh, sensitive triggers for psychological feeling states. Uh, but of course, we, we could easily go on, you know, with different parameter settings. I talked about the different regression approaches that are possible. We could think of static triggers or dynamic triggers. So dynamic triggers might account more from when the person is coming from a higher level of heart rate variability and then decreases, right? We could uh, look at this one or we could also look at a more static, uh, aggregated across larger periods of time, decreases uh, of heart rate variability. We could see or could, could uh, somehow manipulate the threshold when a heart rate variability is really lower. So for now, we apply half a standard deviation below the predicted value, given a certain amount of movement, right? So when it's a half a standard deviation below this predicted value, we would say this is interesting in psychological terms, but why not take one standard deviation or 0.7 or 0.3? Nobody knows, actually. So there's quite a lot to do uh, for research to yeah, refine these uh, potential triggers then that can be used for just-in-time adaptive interventions. Uh, and the main question that, that we are particularly concerned about is, um, are there specific patterns of heart rate variability decreases for different psychological concepts? for rumination, for perceived stress, for safety, for lower quality of social interactions, and so on. So are there specific things happening in the heart rate variability, or is this a more generalized thing associated with mm, rather not so good feeling states? Nobody knows, and we are in the process of yeah, getting slowly into into, into this uh, analysis of specificity. Now, the main question is, of course, how valid are these triggers? And I presented you this 13 out of 29 minutes. Sounds a bit weird, right? So this is a natural law or something? 13 out of 29, not very, very reasonable, right? So is this a, a stable uh, pattern? Does it... Um, uh, is, it, is it stable within a person, right, from one day to the next and so on? Is it stable between persons? So when we have these trigger settings and now collect a completely new sample, is this pattern still valid for the sample or not? And of course, does it really work in, in real-time mode? And um, at the last uh, minutes now, I will briefly give you an, an outlook into this uh, real-time analysis of this um, uh, trigger settings uh, that we just recently conducted. So we took actually really our 13 out of 29 minutes algorithm right, that I presented you that was associated with lower quality of social interactions. And we did this setting, did a calibration for every person for one day, and then, okay, collected the data for three days. And now we really did an online, real-life triggering. So whenever 13 minutes of decreases in a time window of 29 minutes occurred, we sent out a trigger via Bluetooth to the smartphones and asked individuals, how stressed do you feel? Uh, did you ruminate or not? How uh, did you perceive the social interactions you were in? Right? And really to see, OK, is it valid? Does it work in this real-time mode? Can we predict this state really out of physiological data? 
So we had a modest, moderate sample of 36 participants. Uh, we collected the data as I presented already. And the prompts were either delivered really contingent with this uh, non-metabolic reductions, or also we applied random prompts, right? Just triggering, asking individuals, so how do you feel now? And of course we try to compare these different triggers and we expected that when individuals were triggered by the physiology, they would report higher stress, uh, more, more ruminative thoughts and lower quality of social interactions as compared to random assessments, right? So we applied multi-level models to predict it again. And what we actually found, nothing, nothing. And there was no effect. You can see it's far from any significance, nothing. So we were not able, out of this trigger setting that was simulated in a data set and which was able to predict low quality social interactions, then put it into real time mode, we could not really predict if individuals were feeling in this or that way. So this was really disappointing. Then we took the same data set again, did again the simulations and, and tried to, to see whether our real time trigger actually worked as expected. But we also found only about 27% of correspondence between the triggers that were sent out actually to the participant and the triggers that would have ideally, ideally been omitted, uh, emitted to the, to the individual. So something did not work properly out of technical reasons, out of other uh, probably uh, methodological details that were somehow a bit different uh, in the real time setting. And uh, when, we, when we really applied these uh, um, um, simulations on this data set, we rather found, you can see it in these uh, uh, two, two uh, graphs here, even reverse patterns of findings, right? So when there was a trigger, when there were these uh, decreases, non-metabolic decreases in heart rate, individuals reported on a tendency lower stress as compared to random assessments they reported a uh, higher quality of social interactions. So it really did not work out at all. And we are quite puzzled about it. So the effects were heterogeneous, just calling for moderators. We were also looking for many different moderators. There were some moderators, so gender, for example, the trigger seemed to work differently for men and women. Uh, it depends on the regression algorithm, actually on the slope and intercept the threshold uh, and uh, so uh, um, even we even found some some reverse pattern of raw heart rate variability and this aggregated heart rate variability in predicting uh, these psychological feeling states i don't want to go into these details but overall it's been quite shocking right to see that we are not able to arrive at at really good triggers so Finally, the conclusions, I really try to pull together the different strings now. Can we predict adverse psychological states in real time assessment of heart rate variability? No, honestly not. At least we did not succeed so far. And this is quite disappointing news, uh, but the good news is that the trigger actually really identifies moments of lower heart rate variability. So. When we compare it to random assessments, yes, the trigger works. Of course, this might be trivial, but the trigger works in detecting these episodes of non-metabolic reductions in heart rate variability. But, however, these reductions are not systematically somehow associated with psychological feeling states, with a bad and worse feeling that individuals have. So the simulated uh, triggers even predicted a reverse pattern. This is particularly puzzling, you know, because usually you find quite some, some uh, hints in the literature, lower heart rate variability, predicts rumination, stress, and low quality social interactions. But this is not an easy story, obviously, at least when looking at the dynamics within persons, within individuals. So what are we doing now? 
uh, we are still working on these uh, algorithm developments. Um, we are yet hesitant about applying these, you know, for, for just-in-time adaptive interventions because we are not sure what is happening within the individual. Are these moments the right moments of vulnerability or not? Uh, we need to better align also simulation approaches and real-life uh, approaches. This is a methodological thing that needs to be considered. And we also need to examine the impact of other algorithm settings. There are many, many more uh, adjustments that could be done to these algorithms. And of course, we need larger samples, more diverse samples to derive such trigger settings and then to really see do the findings replicate you know, in other samples. And this is quite a large amount of research to be done. The future direction is now for now, we advocate for detecting these decreases, maybe by, by really monitoring hardware variability. But then, and this is maybe for psychology, not a bad news, but then to ask individuals about their actual feeling states. And only when we have this decrease in hardware variability accompanied by an increase in stress rating, right? Individuals might at certain periods in time say, I'm really stressed, and they got triggered by heart rate variability trigger, so heart rate variability is low, and they say, yeah, now I'm stressed, then this could be the right moment to um, implement just-in-time adaptive interventions, and when heart rate variability decreases, and they say, no, I'm not stressed, then we leave it out, right? So combining physiology and psychology, and then uh, uh, develop this just in, or implement this just in time adaptive intervention. So this is our current approach that we are trying to do. Um, now let's say the road to the GDIs out of physiology remains attractive, but it is hampered by several roadblocks and unresolved potholes. But some days, hopefully, we shall arrive. And this is the end. I thank you very much for your. Uh, attention. I apologize for being a bit over time, uh, but finally, I, I really want to thank my postdoc here, uh, Christian Rominger, without whom uh, the, the studies would have not been possible. He developed much of the uh, MATLAB code and R scripts and, and so on, the, all these simulation approaches. So I'm, I'm really grateful for, for his help. Data uh, and code is available. Um, uh, via open science framework. And I'm happy now to discuss uh, these findings together with you and answer questions. Thank you very much. Um, so there's actually already a first question in the Q&A. And if uh, anyone else uh, would like to uh, to ask any questions, feel free to put them there. Uh, it's a question from uh, Malte Steinhoff, um, who says, could um, initial elevation bias have contributed to the unexpected findings? And could you solve this by having more measurement moments? Um, and she also refers to uh, Pinas paper, uh, if I see this correctly. Yeah, I, th I think one of the main main challenges actually is uh, that we do not have actually a, a very dense uh, assessment of psychological states, right? To really fully capture also the dynamics of. Um, uh, psychological feeling states, right? So usually we just have uh, approximately every 45 minutes or one hour our psychology assessed somehow, but really to, to monitor the differences in, in feeling states, we would really need a much more dense assessment, which is of course quite burdensome to the, to the individuals. And of course, with, with respect to the dynamics in, in heart rate variability, this is another completely different story again, right? So, I mean, our approach now for now is really to, to just use this gross regression and then we, we can really predict with every um, amount of bodily movement out of our calibration day, HRE would be somehow in this area, right? And then it's half a standard deviation below. We can predict this, this would be something that is interesting. Uh, but uh, this uh, decrease from a high level, right, going down, um, there are many different possibilities to, to quantify this dynamic shift 
in heart rate variability. And honestly, what we actually has done most is really more, more the static triggers, right? Not really looking at from which level HRV actually comes down, but just uh, looking at, okay, at this moment in time, it would be lower, but uh, it's not really, the intercept is not really adjusted to this uh, dynamic shift uh, of, of heart rate variability. So there's quite a lot of, lot to do for, for future research. I'm not sure whether I answered the question correctly, but just I, I, I hope so. We'll hear from back from Malta, uh, I guess. Um, I have a question for you as well, myself, um, particularly regarding um, the hardware you've used. So you've um, relied on the MovieSense uh, hardware on the one end. Um, so I was wondering, do you have any recommendations in, in terms of uh, that? Is that the best hardware to use or there are, are there any uh, other devices that you would recommend on the one hand? And the second question is actually a follow-up is like, um, I mean, you've, you've painted a pretty nuanced and sometimes a little bit disappointing picture about what you can expect from these technologies at this point. Um, what are your thoughts on um, the increasing emergence of commercially available wearables that, uh, that well, pretend to give you feedback on elevated stress uh, levels? Because I, I know they don't rely on HRV, obviously. They, they even rely on, on secondary measures. But I wanted to know your thoughts on that as well. And, and maybe also more in general, um, advice that we as psychologists should give to people who heavily rely on these type of uh, devices already. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very, very, very interesting. Good questions, actually. So uh, the, to the first question, um, yeah, actually we we use this this movie sense devices because um, as far as we know to date. These devices are really among the few that are available that mm -hmm. offer the opportunity, you know, to to synchronize somehow the smartphone together with a solid physiological monitoring device, and they communicate via Bluetooth. This works not every time very reliable, so we are not really uh, enthusiastic about this. Uh, but uh, alternatives are are difficult to find actually, and. Uh, we we need to wait and see, you know, for for other manufacturers to jump onto this one because, especially in the field of of uh, psychophysiology, most of the devices are more um, um, tailored to medical applications or physicians and and so on. So they do not have this opportunity to ask somehow the the psychological and contextual information and so on. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, MovieSense is one of, of the only ones actually who, who offer this and uh, it's far from being perfect, unfortunately. The other one is, uh, yeah, more and more variables are out there. There are many devices that claim to assess your stress or your sleep patterns and, and so on. I would be actually very cautious about it. I mean, of course, it's not really uh, difficult to uh, quantify somehow uh, increases in heart rate uh, or increases in physiological arousal in general. Uh, I think this works pretty well. So the main question about then for, for us as, as psychologists is what, what do these increases in physiology actually indicate? And especially with respect to cardiac parameters, I would be very, very cautious, right? Because at least in our studies, and I think in, in many different others as well, we, we see, for example, that uh, positive activated feeling states, right? Like feeling dynamic, awake, interested, and so on, are also associated with reductions in heart rate variability and increases in heart rate, right? Because we feel at this moment enthusiastic, active, these emotional states prepare us somehow for action. This is good, actually. So it all comes down you know, to the specificity of these physiological changes. And of course, psychophysiology for decades, right, trying to find unique signatures for different psychological feeling states. And obviously, it's, it's very, very difficult. One thing that could be interesting indeed in this respect is to use somehow more physiological variables and they use machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to somehow predict 
how individuals actually feel. Is this really stress or not? Of course, you can say your, your body somehow reacts, and when your body reacts, this is stress. But uh, I, I would not do uh, this because, as a psychologist, I do not believe in this one-to-one -one relationship. Right? So, yeah, um, and I would caution against the, the overly simple interpretation of these findings. So when patients or clients use such devices and right, said, okay, this will now assess my level of stress, it does not always indicate whether you're really stressed. And <clears throat> I think especially as psychologists, we should not forget about the subjective level. Right? And this is something that I really learned in the last decade. Relying only on physiology is, is just too short uh, and too simple. Uh, when individuals feel that they are stressed, this is very important, right? Because it's subjective feeling as well. And of course, physiology might somehow be interesting to see whether the body reacts the same way as well, but it must not be closely related to each other. So I would really also instruct her to look also more into their personal feeling of these situations. All right. Um, I need to keep track of time, but there's two final questions I would like to ask you. One is from Matt Rostorn asking if the uh, HRV measurement uh, could be made more reliable. Could that be in time be used to titrate anxiety medication? Um, are you, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, anxiety medication? Uh, uh, you mean when, when patients use this? I, I, uh, I assume that it would, uh, would be used to, uh, to, to tailor dosages, essentially, uh, based on the responses that people have in naturalistic settings, I guess. But... From, from your explanation, I think in time it might be, yeah, to get the dose right, uh, Matt says, yeah. Okay, so to use HRV to, to set the right dose. Yes. <laughs> this is an interesting idea, actually. Uh, but again, I, I would be would be very cautious. I mean, of course, uh, you, you could somehow assess HRV uh, complementary you know, to, other, to other things. Uh, more, maybe more as a kind of characteristic of the person, right? Because during everyday life, as we have seen, it really strongly fluctuates and you can't really tell what, what is happening there, what is going on. Um, but of course, when, when you uh, see maybe uh, excessive episodes of decreases, you might want to know actually what is happening there. And it could be an indicator, right, to trying to change those or not. But I'm not really sure how sensitive actually it, it is. Um, and uh, I'm also not aware of studies uh, doing this. Uh, but when you, when you have some, some uh, research in this area, just please let me know. I'm very happy about it, to learn about it. Um, so a cautionary, yes, probably, but uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe one final question then, uh, again by Malte, who said, well, um, do you have literature suggestion for an overview study describing the hesitancy that you mentioned for using physiological indicators for psychological states? Uh, because it's indeed a notion that she says she hears a lot, and I have as well, uh, but she was not able to find a concise overview paper discussing this. So any suggestions there by any chance? Uh, for... Uh, for HRV uh, related to psychological things, or well, more, more in general, I think that that's like using uh, physiological indicators for psychological um. states, and it's something that warrants caution. Um, I, mm -hmm. I myself, in general, say that I mean that these the type of measures tend to measure activation, but that they don't necessarily say anything regarding their valence. But it, I also don't know any yeah. particular mm. paper by by Hart that 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 discusses this in more detail. Right, yeah. No, actually, there, there is one classical paper from the 90s. It's uh, from uh, the late John Cacioppo and Tassinari, his co-author. Um, and this is, don't ask me about the source. I, I need to, to check it again. So, so but, it, uh, might be, it might be worth well to, to, uh, to reach out to Andreas and he'll have please. to set you on your way. Um, right. Maybe to, to wrap it, this up in, in, in general as well, um, I think it's important to, to note that if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Andreas. We'll make this recording available online afterwards, as well as uh, the handouts. 
So if you have any future questions, don't hesitate to reach out. And, and finally, I think you've prepared like a nice lead to the next webinar as machine learning will be the scope of David's talk. So I don't know if he's gonna go into uh, physiological states, but at the very least, it might be interesting to see uh, what this domain will have to offer for uh, psychology in the coming years as well. So uh, with that, on the guess, I would like to thank you for, uh, for the time you've spent uh, uh, being with us and uh, elaborating on your work. Uh, I would like to thank you all for attending and I hope to see you in the future webinars as well. Um, you have a nice day and uh, uh, look forward to, uh, to seeing you again in the future. Cheers. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much, Tom. Bye-bye.